Coming to DARPA is like grabbing the nose cone of a rocket and holding on for dear life. DARPA's a place where if you don't invent the internet, you only get a B. A DARPA program manager quite literally invents tomorrow. Coming to work every day and being humbled by that. DARPA is not one person or one place. It's a collection of people that are excited about moving technology forward. For more than 60 years, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, has held to a singular and enduring mission to make pivotal investments in breakthrough technologies for national security. Working with innovators inside and outside of government, DARPA has repeatedly delivered on that mission, transforming revolutionary concepts and even seeming impossibilities into practical capabilities. Welcome to Voices from DARPA, a window onto DARPA's programs, partners, and performers. My name is Stacey Wurzba, and I'll be your DARPA host today. In 1890, American lawyer and later Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis pioneered the principle of a person's right to privacy. In today's big data world, privacy has become a bigger issue than ever. A 2019 Pew Research Center poll highlighted that 70% of Americans are concerned about the security of their personal data. This comes at a time when technology advances continue to connect us in ways that Justice Brandeis could likely never imagine. At DARPA, cryptography expert Dr. Josh Barron is looking at ways to improve privacy, not only for national security purposes, but for the greater good of society. The work that I do here at DARPA is kind of motivated both by my background in cryptography and thinking through cryptographic and privacy issues. I'm very interested in technologies that affirm democratic values and am cognizant that some of the tech that we develop if we're doing it right, could have the ability to make, for example, like authoritarian regimes have to work a little bit harder. Clearly, U.S. forces in the field might have a desire for anonymous communications. But most of the work that I do, it doesn't necessarily appear to be so direct. What I'm most interested in is the Department of Defense's and the national security community's relationship with the world And so when I talk about privacy issues, the privacy issues that we address certainly impact the DOD community, but it also really does impact the larger American and even global communities. And one of the reasons for that is because I think it's important that we view the national security community as citizens of the United States and of the world, just like everyone else. I run programs in cryptography, privacy, and anonymity. On the cryptographic side, I helped finish a program called Brandeis, which was looking at privacy-preserving technologies, so it's both cryptography and privacy. I ran a program called Cooperative Secure Learning, which was an artificial intelligence-related program on privacy-preserving machine learning, also using cryptography. And then on the anonymity side, also involving cryptography, but primarily focused on anonymity, I run this program called RACE, or Resilient Anonymous Communication for Everyone, that's about looking at new ways of possibly doing really resilient secure communications that could be available to everyone. And the most recent one I started was MICE, Measuring the Information Control Environment, And that is about open source technologies to measure how authoritarian regimes try to control their information environment via often censorship or throttling or blocking of the internet. I run a program called CIV, which is about zero knowledge technology. One of the major technologies that DARPA helped develop about 10 years ago is this notion of fully homomorphic encryption, which is a way of taking something, encrypting it, offloading it to the cloud, and then computing arbitrarily on that encrypted value and then returning it to you. Zero knowledge is more subtle. A zero-knowledge proof is a mathematical technique to verify the correctness of information without revealing the information itself. While still fairly nascent, its potential for securing private information is huge. Zero-knowledge is one of these really fascinating areas in the sense that it was developed in the late 80s and is only kind of now being really examined broadly by a large swath of the technical community because of its ties to cryptocurrency technologies. So in fully homomorphic encryption, you have the ability to compute on the information, whereas in zero knowledge, you're making a statement about something that was already computed. Now, that may sound subtle, but believe it or not, it is about four to five orders of magnitude faster to do zero knowledge than it is to do fully homomorphic encryption. To put in perspective what five orders of magnitude would be, that would be like instead of going from the East Coast to the West Coast in hours, it taking milliseconds. 
as an example, maybe I want to prove to you that your computer system is vulnerable, but because we may not have the closest relationship, I don't want to necessarily give you the exact details of the vulnerability. And maybe we then engage in a conversation and start to have a more of a, say, a business relationship or a working relationship. So how can I prove to you that this thing exists without just giving away the store? And so zero-knowledge proof technology allows us to do that. The reason it's become so in vogue in the cryptocurrency world is there are all sorts of things you want to prove without revealing, say, how much cryptocurrency you have or other kind of sensitive details associated with currency transactions. What we're trying to do at DARPA is to say, well, look, doing currency-related stuff is super cool, but what DOD-relevant statements could we actually prove in zero knowledge? And so the three broad categories that we are looking at, one is statements about software. So can we prove that something is insecure in zero knowledge? Could I prove that different sensitive software widgets can be composed into a broader whole without having to necessarily reveal the exact details of the software widgets? We're doing work in zero knowledge proofs related to algorithms. So can I show that a machine learning classifier was made using only appropriate data without revealing details of the data? Or could I reveal that I have this machine learning classifier, I don't want to reveal it to you because it's super proprietary, but maybe you want to test it. Maybe you want to give it inputs and show that this classifier isn't biased. And so what I give you are these outputs and I prove to you that I used my classifier and then you can see the results and decide for yourself whether it was biased or not, but I don't actually have to show you the underlying classifier. And the last one, which I think is almost the most blue sky, is these socio-technical interactions. So can I prove that business processes or algorithms are privacy law compliant without necessarily revealing the details of those algorithms and things on that order. We are funding a pretty decent amount of research in taking real world concepts and literally translating them into math so that we can give ourselves this formalism that we then give a zero knowledge proof on. But of course, there are meta issues associated with this. And so one of the things we are thinking a bit about is the actual relationship of prover and verifier and the components of that proof, not just as a mathematical construct, but actually a little bit as a sociological or almost philosophical construct to try to get into how do we formally or rigorously think about this prover verifier relationship in such a way as to actually think about what kinds of zero knowledge proofs would most be useful. And that's a study we're actually running on the side of CIV. As we think about leading our lives increasingly in an online fashion, and we come into daily issues associated with privacy in our online lives, I do think that zero knowledge could play a really important role in demonstrating that our online activities are within bounds for some definition of what that is, while still maintaining the important anonymity aspects that we tend to view as pretty important for our lives. In addition to exploring real-world applications of zero-knowledge proofs, Dr. Barron recently commissioned a report by the company Trail of Bits that looked closely at the fundamental properties of blockchain technologies. Blockchains today are increasingly used in a variety of contexts. They're presumed to be immutable or unsusceptible to change because of strong cryptography as well as decentralized operations and control. But are those security assumptions accurate? And why does DARPA care? One of the core missions for DARPA is anticipating technological surprise. And while I wouldn't say at this point that these kinds of distributed technologies and blockchain technologies are surprising, I think there is still something to the idea that these technologies may really get integrated into national security systems, for example. I here at DARPA hadn't been seeing anyone taking a what I would call a holistic view at blockchain technology cybersecurity. And by that, I mean the whole way that we view these distributed technologies is that they're distributed and therefore they're resilient. And so we almost like say, oh, well, it's being run on like a thousand computers and therefore clearly it's secure because it's running on so many of them, you know, what can go wrong? While it's true that blockchain technologies run on many, many systems, at a conceptual level, you can think of them as one system. And so it's a system that is in a distributed fashion performing a specific functionality. And so when you view it that way, then the question becomes, well, okay, now that I think of it as one system, what are the different properties of this system, even though it's in many places? That is why I was very interested in this study, because it really wanted to take a very holistic view of all of the different issues through which blockchain technology could be vulnerable. It turns out what they found was that the way in which we think of resilience or security when it comes to these distributed technologies may deserve a second look. I think it's important to recognize that a lot of the relevant issues we looked at in this report would involve an incredibly sophisticated actor or adversary, for example, to try to really affect these currencies. What I'm particularly worried about, and especially I think the national security community should be particularly worried about, are high sophistication actors. So just because we haven't seen it in the last 10 years doesn't mean we're not going to see it over the next 
two or three. I think cryptocurrency technologies are a really intriguing way of building cybersecurity out of distributing your kind of most sensitive components across as many elements as you can. I just want us to be careful that when you do that, you're still thinking holistically about the cybersecurity issues and that we don't just say, oh, well, because it's in 10 places, that's by definition more secure. Two additional programs in Dr. Barron's portfolio focus on different ends of the privacy spectrum. First, there's Measuring the Information Control Environment, or MICE, an AI exploration effort. MICE seeks to develop algorithms and open source software that would automate analysis about foreign authoritarian regimes' attempts to control and repress their public's communications using digital means. So MICE is six projects running over 18 months. It's like $6 million, which is smaller and kind of shorter than your average DARPA program. Your average DARPA program is generally on the order of four years. And so I think of them as sprints. And the sprint that I specifically wanted to do in this effort was to look at technology available today, even in the open source, about sensing, trying to understand just from a pure data perspective, when countries are trying to block the internet or otherwise censor their internet. There are just a number of these. They're on the public domain. And what I really wanted to do was turbocharge them, essentially by leveraging artificial intelligence technology to take these broad amounts of data that these sensors are looking at and try to make them more fine-grained. And then if you really want to be kind of blue sky about it, even predictive. So given the data that I see today, make a prediction about how someone might be censoring tomorrow. On the flip side, the Brandeis program, named after, you guessed it, Louis Brandeis, looks at how to preserve privacy by making complex computations, even on a mobile device. What we're doing here in this Brandeis effort, uh, in this particular Brandeis technology, was distributing the computation to the mobile devices and essentially moving away from the cloud. We're actually just about to release some technology that I'm particularly excited about, and there's going to be something coming out in the next weeks to months where the actual computation is occurring purely on mobile phones. And just to put that in like historical perspective, like 10 years ago, we had the DARPA Proceed effort, which is about fully homomorphic encryption and reducing the asymptotic complexity of that by seven orders of magnitude, even though it was still about seven orders of magnitude kind of slower than just running it natively. And now here we are where you know like 10 different parties can be computing on encrypted information jointly just on mobile phones. Every DARPA program manager has a formative moment that ignited their passion for their field of expertise. Whether it's an unsuspecting mentor or an aha moment as a child, no two entry points are alike, but all are fascinating. I think reading like cyberpunk literature such as Neil Stevenson was incredibly formative to me. But also just like, I mean, watching the movie Hackers uh, and, you know, just, just being completely blown away by using technology to empower yourself and others to do Wild and crazy things is also a thing that is important. Really, when you get down to it, what I'm interested in is information and who has it and who doesn't and what that implies. You know, when you talk about privacy or anonymity, it's really about the study of information flowing and how that information is controlled, how we're going to move forward as a country in a big data world, but still being ever more attuned to people's privacy. The way I see it, there are probably two different paradigms that we can move ahead with, and I'm honestly not sure which is the right one, or maybe it's both. One is where we fundamentally trust the people who have our data to treat our data accordingly. And maybe what the technology that we need is to leverage something like AI to literally build digital representatives of ourselves that live within the data ecosystem and like represent our interests. But to do that would fundamentally involve the companies themselves like allowing that kind of thing to happen. I'll say that's the optimistic view. The more pessimistic view is that we really can't trust other people to really do well with our data. And so then in that respect, maybe what we should be thinking more about is how it, they come to collect our data in the first place and just building ever more careful technology that never lets private data get out. And just by the way, one of the most important parts about that would be having low user burden discussions between, say, your phone and yourself about what data it is that you truly don't want to leave. We've funded it as part of Young Faculty Awards, as part of Brandeis, but that still needs ever more funding is what's often called human factors research or human computer interaction. And that's really about forgetting about how well the privacy technology does or doesn't work. How do we have faithful conversations between the technology and people about what exact privacy should be maintained? And then the trade-off between, well, if I restrict this kind of data, maybe you're going to get less good services in some respect, and how people can actually kind of understand that desire. Trust 
information security, and people's privacy will continue to be challenged as technology evolves. But Dr. Barron and his team are undeterred. DARPA is one of these organizations that you have the potential to make a great deal of difference in terms of the technical research direction that the United States' research community and global research community looks at. To me, the thing that makes DARPA awesome is the same thing that makes it a challenge, which is they, they let you come here and they say, go do awesome things. So yeah, you have to go do awesome things. That's quite the challenge. However, the way you do awesome things is by engaging with the most awesome people. I tend to think of it like being a conductor of an orchestra, where what we're trying to do is to try to find the best violin player, the best pianist, the best whatever it is and what have you. And then probably the one thing that a program manager does more than anything else is figure out how these different parts play together to create a coherent whole. But most importantly, it's really about ensuring that the people you engage in are given the space to do the very best work that they can do meeting people, having open-ended discussions, engaging with them. And then once you have a research relationship with them, them telling you about the cool new result that they just uncovered. And oh, by the way, that result may or may not have direct relevance to the thing that you actually asked them to research. But that's the really cool part about DARPA is that, again, I would never want to prescribe a research relationship that DARPA has to just the very narrow of the very specific thing we asked you to do, because that's not how people's brains work, right? You set them on a path and then they had this other brilliant idea and then they engage with you on it. And you're like, oh, wait, no, maybe we actually should be thinking about that thing even more than the thing that we initially thought we should be thinking on and then pivoting and doing that thing. That's all incredible. And then the other part is the ability to engage with folks in government who are just doing such incredible things. Part of being a DARPA is there's this kind of unspoken idea that the folks within the Department of Defense or just, again, within the broader government are coming to you because they have specific problems and they want you to help with those problems. And then as part of that, they're really going to get into the weeds with you and tell you kind of what their day-to-day -day looks like. That's just such an incredible privilege just to see these people doing the nation's work and then figuring out how to support them. Thanks for tuning in to this Voices from DARPA podcast episode, and special thanks to Tom Shortridge for producing this podcast and Heather Dees for her assistance. For more information on the work in Dr. Barron's portfolio or any other DARPA effort, visit DARPA.mil.